Hey folks, I'm without Simon tonight. He's gone to Faulty Towers. But my Basil, hmm, for the next two hours, <laughs> is Andrew McLaren. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Phil. Good to be with you again, I think. It's uh, really good to be in your company. Yes, it is. And looking forward to Nightline and all the splendours it contains. And so, a special bonus, a little later, Peter Hitchener uh, making uh, a wonderful appearance. He's always so welcome on the show. Always got a lot of feedback when Peter's been in. Yes, he's a, he's a wonder he's wonderful company, isn't he, Peter? Uh, wouldn't he be fun? on an overseas flight. Imagine you had a 15-hour flight to LA and you could choose your company. Yes. Wouldn't he be fun to sit next to? I think he would, although on a plane that would stretch any friendship as far as I could tell. <laughs> oh, something and, about plane travel, man. Oh, man. And, and I'd be dying for a cigarette and get here, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> yes, it must be for you on those long flights. Uh, you must nearly go mad wanting a fag. I switch off. I, I sort of... Um, I. I turn down all my metabolism and uh, I sort of go into a trance, almost like a zombie. Am I allowed to ask you a probing and personal question on the matter of uh, travel? Yeah. Do you travel f economy or business? Uh, always economy, but this time, because it's a long flight to South America, premium economy. I've, oh, gone, I, up, I've gone up one leg. I believe it's quite nice, too, so, but, uh, but economy to me is still... I know it's, you're lucky to be able to travel on yeah. a plane and all that, we shouldn't complain, but it is really uh, very taxing. Yeah, well, I'm flying Qantas across the Pacific, and uh, I feel very comfortable and safe flying Qantas. But I couldn't afford to go business. It's about four times, oh, no. four times the economy fare. So what must first class be, yeah, and, and we all land at the same time, don't we, and virtually eat That's the same true. food? Though I do, when you walk through the business class section to get to the steerage out the yes. back of the plant, uh, to economy, uh, I do kind of envy those pods that uh, business class provide these oh, days. Oh, yes. You, like a little bed yeah. you get. Oh, by the way, today's September 22nd, and mm. see how well you know me. This is an anniversary for me, a third anniversary of something very, um, very important in my life three years ago today. Three years ago And today. I'll give you a clue, I was in Hong Kong. Oh, was it three years ago you had the fall? Three years ago at this hour, at this precise time, Hong Kong time, that I fell down 36 marble stairs, no, 35, I exaggerate, 35 marble <laughs> stairs, split my head open and broke my hip. Gee, and you thought are, I you're, broke, you're thought very I, lucky to be here, Phil. I thought I'd broken my leg, but rang my friend Jill, who's a medical lady, she said, don't sound like your hip, and she was right. Yeah, and you're you still okay? I, you have, you've come back pretty well. You, you don't have real hip problems, do you? Oh, well, I do limp a little. Uh, you know, hence, <laughs> hence the sticker in the car. And I guess the, those uh, Limbo Rock Championships are off the, uh, off the scene they now. Are at the they? moment, yeah. even the Paralympics, I'm not allowed to compete. <laughs> now, let's get serious for a moment. Yes. Well, uh, Simon's left me with an interesting book called 15 Young Men, Australia's Untold Football Tragedy. It's been written by Paul Kennedy. Paul, good evening to you. Good evening, Phil and Andrew. Uh, yes, well, I've, I've just picked up this book and I've been thumbing through it, and exactly 20 years before the Titanic sank, we had a similar tragedy in Port Phillip Bay, didn't we, Paul? Yes, and unfortunately uh, no survivors in this one. It was 1892, and it was uh, a, a team, a football team, Aussie Rules, obviously, from the town of Mornington, uh, previously known as Snapper Point, known to some of the locals as The Point. And uh, the team from The Point went to Morty Alec and uh, decided to, to go. Because it was Queen's birthday and uh, it was a bit more of a special long weekend, they decided to take the boat to Morty Alec up the coast. Because yeah, uh, normally, the normally, normally they went by train, didn't they? Yes. They did. It depends where they went on the peninsula. Uh, if they cut across to, to Hastings, they, uh, they went by horse and cart. Um, but uh, if they went to... And they, they, sometimes went by horse and cart to Frankston as well, although the train line had been established all the way to Mornington in 1889, three years before. But this time, the um, one of the team, the local fisherman, Charles Hooper, he convinced his team to, to go on the boat. He was a bit of a regatta sailor as well in, in his old cooter boat. Was, we know them as cooter boats now, but uh, that's the best description of the type of boat. He decided to put his racing sails on and he enticed the, the young blokes on the team to go with him. They had a great trip. On the way to Mordialic, they sang songs, and one of them played the cornet, and uh, they, they were very musical, obviously, in those days, and uh, played a game of football. It was two goals apiece, so it was a draw, 
and the way home, the, the weather worsened. Uh, they got hit by a squall and they came to grief in Port Phillip and uh, unfortunately there was no search party launched until the next morning and by that stage um, all of the players had died. The, the bo a boat like that would hug pretty close to the shore, you would think, so it's, it's quite surprising there was such a tragedy. Yeah, if you shoot, um, if you shoot straight from Mornington to Mordialloc, which is pretty much what they did, um, it does go into the bay by about um, uh, maybe a mile. So at a kilometre and a half, um, my research suggests they were out in the bay oh. um, approaching Mornington. They would have seen the two lights at Mornington. They got close enough to see those lights um, when they had the accident. When they found the boat the next day, it had drifted in so close to um, a place called Pelican Point, which is just off Mount Eliza, that um, the, the searchers must have thought initially, well, if the boat's so close, um, perhaps some of them had swum to shore. Yes. But, uh, of course, the accident happened further out and, uh, and the cold water prevented, uh, would, would have ultimately prevented mm. even the best swimmer making it to shore just because of the cold water shock and then what would have happened to their bodies. We do know from the evidence of the boat and the scratches on the hull and the broken mizzen mast that the players did survive, at least some of them survived, uh, perhaps up to a, for a few hours mm. um, and, and struggled for life and waited for help and, uh, and it was to um, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, there was, there was no hope because the, the search didn't come until the next morning. Yeah, so the point I want to ask is, was it due to treacherous seas or due to that reef just off the beach? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question, actually. Some some thought that it might have been the reef, but um, it was due to a squall, basically, a, a rush of wind, and the very delicately balanced forces on the boat. They had um, the, the description was that it wasn't overloaded, but of course that that might have been a bit kind to the, the skipper because 15, 15 uh, people on a boat of that size, very close to being overloaded, and another fisherman told an inquiry that. He thought that if the weather, weather wasn't perfect, then it was overloaded. Most of the players would have been sitting up on the weather side, leaning back into the wind. Yes. And, uh, and when the, the wire stay of Halyard snapped, so there was a, a mechanical fault there, but that, that came about because of the, uh, the gust of wind. And, mm. uh, and, and after that, they, they had no hope. The, the boat tipped, and in fact, the ballast was loose in the bottom of the boat, which did them no favours at all because... Um, They'd taken the nets out, the fishing nets. They'd replaced it with some ballast, but it was loose. So when, when the boat tipped and uh, the, the ballast fell into the stern, then half the, half the boat was, was sank and it was mm. bobbing, in, bobbing like a bottle. Mm. And so it was very hard to hang on to and, and of course, impossible to, to stay in. Although they did find one body with the boat and he was tangled up in the ropes completely mm. naked. Mm. Uh, Paul Kennedy, I compliment you on some excellent uh, sketches and photographs in the book from 1892, many from yeah. the Argus and the Australasian. But looking at the boat, it, it's for under sail and looks for all the world like a yacht, but it looks a very small vessel for 15 footballers plus one captain. Yeah, that's right. And, and there were questions, I guess the questions were... Uh, was it overloaded? And I think I answered that. Um, the inquiry, in fact, it was different in those days. And in the newspaper coverage, they didn't criticise the captain um, heavily. And there were a couple of inquiries as well. But uh, I think if it hadn't had it happened now, there'd be some heavy criticism and much more scrutiny. But I think uh, because no one survived and the town was grieving, and in fact the entire colony grieved with the town, they didn't seem to, uh, to have much criticism for the captain at all. He had his 13-year-old son on the boat, um, which uh, goes a little bit... Uh, I, I had to look into the fact of whether or not there was any booze at play. Um, the fact that the, the game finished so late and there was very little time between the game and jumping on the boat, and also the captain having his 13-year-old son uh, as his deckhand on the boat, um, I've all but uh, ruled that out. As, as being mm. a factor. Uh, uh, Paul, it, yeah, was, it's an amazing story. As it's said here, Australia's untold football tragedy, it's a real snapshot of something that is, to my knowledge, been largely forgotten. And I think that's uh, one of your points in the book. It's called 15 Young Men, and it's out now. People can purchase it, can't they? They can. They can go along, and, and fear not. It's not just a, um, not just a tale of... Um, 
of, of woe and sadness and grief. I've, I've tried to um, give some real background to the, to the people and the time and the families and yes. it's about life in colonial uh, Victoria. Um, Fascinating. Oh, uh, when you talk about uh, the grief, uh, there were three boys from one family who perished. That's right, yeah, the Caldwell brothers uh, were the sons of the local Presbyterian minister, a really prominent family in the area. And, um, in fact, the, the research shows that it was the only time they ever played football together. Oh. The older brother, who was 21, he was a resident of Tasmania at the yeah. time yes. and had come home to help um, mend his, his late Uncle Joe's fences oh. and decided on the morning of the game to, to go with his brothers in the boat and play the game. So Dear idea. The, mm. the Caldwells were... Um, you know, they, they lost so much. Yes. A, a lot of others lost breadwinners. Um, there was a, an uncle and a nephew on the boat, and, and um, everyone knew each other. They were a very close-knit team, as only mm. country football teams uh, can be. So, um, yeah, but the Caldwell brothers, interesting stories in, mm. in each of them. And, and uh, you're left wondering what could have become of these young blokes as well. Uh, as, as you do when you, you hear about young people dying at war, you think, well, yes. what could they have been? They were such promising young blokes and, uh, yeah, it was just an awful accident. Well, there'd be descendants listening to us tonight. I mean, the boys obviously had brothers and so on. They're, mm. they're probably uh, people listening tonight who are closer to the tragedy than we were. I finally, and say goodnight to you, Paul Kennedy. As I drive through Mornington, I see a monument which, which up to now I presumed was a moor memorial, but yep. in fact it's not, is it? No, that's the one on the corner of Main Street and the Esplanade. Um, for those people if you're in Mornington, go and have a look at it. It's got all the names and the ages of players, mm. and it was erected in 1893, well yeah. before all of the war memorials went up. Yes. And uh, when they erected it on the first anniversary of that awful accident, the Reverend Caldwell, who lost those three sons, mm. um, made a magnificent speech and uh, was so dignified and, and very sad to to include that in, in the book as you know a, a moment when mm. the town tried to tried to move on a little bit. Of course, um, but you know would have taken decades to get over such mm. such great loss. A large percentage of of young blokes from a very small town. Well, Paul, we feel we know you well from all your media work and from your writing as well. And <laughs> uh, I do recommend this book to people, 15 Young Men, Australia's Untold Football Tragedy. And I'll pay you the ultimate compliment, Paul. I'm about yeah. to fly overseas next week, and I always choose to take one book on the plane with me, which I know I'll find absorbing. And this year, I've chosen yours. Well, I feel very honoured um, <laughs> that you're going to do that. Did I hear you say you're going to South America? I've just been to Rio covering the Olympics. For the oh, Olympics, OK. So. Now I'm going further north to Colombia. Ah, well, that'll, that'll be good. That'll yes. be doing any samba with your, uh, with, with your, with <laughs> no, your injuries as no, well. No, <laughs> I'll, I'll be doing the salsa up there. <laughs> right. the salsa. <laughs> OK, right. Paul, good, good, good catching luck. up with you again. Good night now. And again, folks, the book by Paul Kennedy, uh, I do highly recommend it to you, is 15 Young Men. Peter, Peter, Peter. Hello there, Philip. <laughs> Hello there, Andrew. He is so funny. Don't you think he is one of <laughs> one of the gems of this station? Oh, a, a, a treasure, as I've said on there many I agree times. With you. And I, very underrated. I'm just hoping that tonight we can maybe encourage him to do that, that song that we've grown to associate with him <laughs> on Friday lunch. Oh, come oh, on. Give us, yes. <laughs> give us a couple of Give us a couple of verses on No, I can't. You. No, I can't tonight, Peter. And, I, and Philip, I just can't. I'm been, <laughs> <laughs> like many of us. Oh, no, please. Yes, yeah, wow. so funny. Come on. Oh, no, yeah, would you please take something seriously? Oh, no, this is serious. I, I think know. you just switch off the news, don't you? You just <laughs> turn into a sort of a... You blossom well, into this giggling buffoon. Well, no, because you're so hilarious. I think we... You know, and at this time of night, Philip, you would agree, a laugh does you good, doesn't yes, it? Yes, we're not here to be heavy. We, oh, we're no. very lightweight. Hey, speaking about the lady with, with one shoe and one oh, foot, yes. um, I wonder, have lovely. you that ever, was nice. have you ever put your... Foot in this. Uh, that would be, excuse the pun, but I'll give you one example. Have you ever on there done something like this? When I was on the Gold Coast, Bruce knows the story, I interviewed the, uh, the uh, mayor of the Tweed Shire. His name was Max Boyd, a lovely man, but he was an amputee and had lost his left arm, mm. uh, perhaps in war or who knows where. And yet I said to him on air that day, I said to him, Max, 
I bet you'd give your right arm to oh, be re-elected. Phil, Phil. <laughs> there's, a, there's an imp in our brains that makes us say those things, those things that you, you suddenly think, oh, what did I, I just said? I have done that many yeah. times, and you just want to take the words back, but you can't because... Yeah. They're out there. There's just an imp in your brain that forces you to do it. it. It's you like, can't stop yourself. It's like somebody who's very badly sunburned and you don't know, and you slap them on the back. <laughs> yes, exactly right. <laughs> and, and, and how often have you said to a person without their sight, gee, it's good to see you? Yes, we, that's right. we do it. We just yes, do it yes, yes, and yeah, not maliciously. Yeah. No. Have you had a, an example like that? Andrew? Well, I, I'm, I'm, the first thing that's come to mind is uh, a lady, a lovely lady. I won't give her name. who used to do an interview program on Seven HT when I worked there. And this is not me, obviously. This is, but I was working as sort of her announcer slash panel operator for the her Worms Eye View program, oh. which had been running for many, many years yes. in uh, in Hobart. And uh, Worms she, Eye View. Yes, <laughs> well, that was the name title. of the program. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and she had cold. Joy as a guest, except she'd obviously never heard of Cole Joy and called him Brian throughout the interview. <laughs> and Brian and Cole, being very, very polite, Didn't wasn't correcting her. her. But I'm holding up little signs behind Cole's oh. head with, uh, with, with uh, saying oh. his name is Cole, but she can't read from that. Her sight wasn't too good. And so, I got the giggles all the time, and she's looking at me with daggers, thinking, "Why is this man? Come laugh. on, this is professional." Oh, you would. In, it's did she catch can, on? Did she catch on? Silly young announcer, just giggling away in the background. What did oh. Brian think of it? Well, <laughs> at the end, he said, "Look, I have to say, Edith, that my name is Cole." <laughs> oh, oh, of course, yes. And she just glazed over it like it doesn't matter. Oh, well, I yeah. love it. And had, he was appearing that night at Hobart City Hall. Had anything in your career where you've well, put your foot in? Uh, well, I. Oh, frequently I've done, I've done and said just about every silly thing that you can, but that's being human. But the thing is, I'm frequently called Brian or Mike or David. People really? look at me and think, oh, God, what's his name again? Oh, they do. They and they'll say, it's they'll very say flattering, hello, Brian, though, isn't or, it? hello, Mike, or oh, hello, David. That's and, flattering. And if I'm never going to see them again, I would never correct them because no. I wouldn't want to, you know, be, I wouldn't want to make them feel self-conscious or something. So I just put, you know, just you smile and say, oh, yes, hello there and have a chat. But it's always funny. They say, what are you doing these days? Oh. <laughs> well, actually, I'm doing what I've done for the past 2,000 years. <laughs> and, and so often people say to me still, G'day, Bruce, how are you? But I yes, never correct that's them. that's right. Oh, no. And in years gone by, because we were inseparable, g'day, Pete. Pete Smith yeah, and Peter I were Smith. like twins, you know. Yes. So, um, oh, it's it fun happens, doesn't it? But yeah. you don't correct people because uh, they mean well. Now, how are you enjoying being out of the Royal Show I every day, Peter? I love it. I love the Royal Show. I grew up in the bush, Andrew. I know that you've always been a big city kid. Yeah, I have. And you yes. occasionally you'd go, with, um, you know, with your dad on holidays and selling draper, drapery right, or yeah, mercery or whatever it is that you used to you sell. You do listen, don't no, you? No, I do listen. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, but um, I, I grew up in the bush. And for us, yeah. the local show, the Texas show, was just... Oh, it was Texas. one of those. Oh, Texas, Queensland. Texas, Queensland, yes. Australia. Uh, it was just oh, highlight. It ran for two days. Where did you uh, actually let's establish where you actually grew up? What, what was your near, address? Near Texas. Well, it was Limevale via Inglewood. Oh, but wow. it, it was actually remote. oh, I know, it was actually it was closer to Texas than Inglewood, and uh, we got the papers oh a day or so late, and oh, really? got fresh bread a couple of times a week, wow. and uh, this was you know this was many years ago, and uh, no television, of course. You wouldn't you wouldn't remember it. Time before television. Oh, oh I do. I'm much does. older than brother. <laughs> I, I do, but it, it came in when I was a little kid in primary school. Oh, yes, oh, but yeah. you, you would have, there wouldn't Devil. have been TV coming to that part of Queensland probably for not well for until years. the 60s. Not for years, no. correct. And uh, and so the the show was terrific. And to mm. this very day, when I go to the Melbourne show, even though it's it's a vast organisation compared with the Texas show, yeah. it just reminds me of those lovely days of oh. old where you'd go and just yeah. and there was. Uh, there was a Chinese magician's show. It was a magic show, and um, it was oh, it was wonderful. They they yeah. they toured these uh, with these terrific uh, tricks. It was in a you know one of the ten yeah, shows, sure. and. Uh, the man who ran it, his his stage name was Fooling You, which it sort of, which it was. Was, was he Chinese? Yes, man? he was Chinese. They were, they, they were oh. all Chinese. They did the most wonderful uh, tricks and the most wonderful stunts. I'll never forget, mm. you know. And and one of the things from behind, a, just from behind a, a piece of silk fabric, they produced somehow this 
goldfish bowl with a fish in it and they spilled a little bit of water and yes. turns out they did it every time i don't know how they did the trick but fooling you was one of those great an sort of oh, yeah, yes an illusionist mm. and and on the show circuit and uh, apparently it was a feature of the show circuit for years and and you're on the land where you are your family yes right? yeah. yeah so this would be just so exciting to go for the texas show oh it was and i think we used to present we used to present a, a medal for the best fleece <laughs> the wool fleece yeah, yeah. and i'm not quite sure what it was but I think it might have been a vase, a silver vase or something. <laughs> oh. You know, this was, you know, the height of tea set. Or something. Or tea set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it was great fun. And so, where I'm out of the show every day at the nine stand, and we have so much fun. They're, they're, they do selfies and, mm. and pics and things like that. Yeah. Kids have an opportunity to read the news, and of course, I remind them, don't be too good at that, or I'll never oh. let you back in this room again. <laughs> and and, and Kirsten, <laughs> before we say goodnight to Peter, would you oh. look out a song called? <laughs> oh, it's well, not over yet. That was short and sweet, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but lovely. It's no, no. life in the fast lane. It's not over, but <laughs> Give me a later bump. when we say goodbye, would you find a song to make Peter homesick? It's called Deep in the Heart of Texas. Oh, that's would you the find one. That for me? I remember that. They used to play, and the hospital yeah. hour, Gary Ord used to play that every time he did the Texas hospital show. You know? show. Remember those? Yeah, yellow like I remember that show. Texas 4135 or yeah. whatever it was. Uh, out would come uh, the Yellow Rose oh, yeah. of Texas. Oh, but Deep I, in the heart I can of think Texas. back before Gary Ord, there was Russ Tyson. Russ Tyson, he was terrific and too. And before Russ Tyson, and Mike Connors. Is and that he, so? Oh, yes, I back in the him. 40s. Oh, well, he wouldn't, but he was terrific. I remember Russ Tyson. Didn't ever quite work with him, but I did work with Gary Ord many years ago at the ABC. The, the, the requests for music on the hospital hour always to me were either Girls Were Made to Love and Kiss by Richard Tower <laughs> oh, yes, or, the, yes. or the Elizabethan Serenade from Ron Gid Goodwin's, <laughs> Goodwin's Orchestra. Goodwin's Orchestra, who also did the Miss Marple theme, as I recall. Did he? But that's our, uh, that's our days oh, of beautiful yes. music, Andrew. We've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> you did the Worm's Eye View. I must did a show called The See the World Before You Leave It. <laughs> really? Travel what show. was that about? Oh, oh. That <laughs> what an unfortunate <laughs> name. Oh, goodness me. You just wanted a Jason to the hospital show. Oh, <laughs> yeah, next to the hospital, how about? Oh, dear, it's good fun. Thank oh, you yeah. very much for letting me oh, invade no, your space you, tonight. You're wonderful. But, you know, Gary Orr was a terrific personality. He was, yeah. And, and I always admired Russ Tyson so much. I'd never met the man because he lived in Queensland. But in his... 90s, I phoned him in Queensland and spoke to him about three years before he died. Did you? And we had the most yeah. wonderful chat oh, over lovely. the phone. I'd that's always nice. admired him. And his predecessor, Mike Connors, was married to a Tivoli star. Her name was Queenie Paul. Oh, is that oh, her so. that name? Oh, yes. Yeah, a big star in my grandmother's time. Absolutely. So you're in good company. But, oh, and, yes. and you, you know, Peter is equally at home on radio as you are on television. Like radio. Have you it's ever made fun. any movies yet? <laughs> Have we seen you on the yes, big screen? I've read the news on several movies, several very forgettable movies, oh, actually, but never mind, my chance will come. The Great to... Bookie Robbery, I was the newsreader on that. That's I right, I've yeah. seen oh, that new yeah. yes, right. Yes, I was so good. I... <laughs> oh, <laughs> Not. Right. Never mind, lovely seeing you. Have a lovely night. And Thanks, we wish kids. you, Peter, a very happy weekend. Bye. In the heart of Texas. Well, I only once, uh, some time back. It was unfortunate, though. I was a little ill uh, at that particular time. It was a Dramana uh, many years ago. And I won't go into it because we're doing an ad promoting <laughs> yes. caravan travel. But I just and it was particularly hot, and there was no air conditioning in the caravan, and I baked in this yes. tin sort of box with a vile headache and an upset stomach for about two days. Okay, well I can match that story. I was watching. Uh television one night and they had a documentary like in the outback you know like the Leyland brothers oh yeah and uh, there was a willy willy on the nullarbor and the caravan flipped over oh, well, so gee. i'm a bit nervous too <laughs> gee now we better get back to <laughs> steve's jago if there's still a client oh, indeed uh, phyllis clive kent tiffy chris david sue we're coming to you yes we are what next uh, we've got uh, yes we're coming to you right now in fact are we Yes. Is that right? I'm sorry, Phil. At 20 to 11, it is 3AW. Andrew McLaren filling in for Simon Owens tonight, who has just been at the theatre. But he's such a culture maven. You know that, Phil. He just he, he just can't be without an opening night somewhere in his life. He'll talk about it Sunday night on the weekend wrap. And by the way, our special guest on Remember When Sunday Night, oh, this will bring back memories, is Ron Lees, originally oh, from Sunnyside Up. That's right. He used to be the singer on Sunnyside Up. That's been around forever and still performing better than ever. Phyllis in South Hello, Phyllis. Uh, good evening. Hello, uh, Phyllis. I'll tell you about the dancers. Yeah, you're talking to Andrew tonight. Uh, Andrew, I'm yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, Phyllis. Uh, I'll tell you about the dancers. Yes. 
uh, the British Isle stands is at Merver Long, and it's addressed up night next Tuesday. Football colours. Uh, yes, and also at Williamstown, Cena Sits Hall. There's a dance there every Saturday night, and that's a good band. We've got the Hat Band playing at Merrivale Long, but we've got a great music down at uh, Williamstown. And also at the RSL on Tuesday afternoon, this Tuesday afternoon, they're back again. Yes. Yes, we, uh, the chap that does the music, he does it well. Okay. And my Cheerios. Yes. I won't keep you long. And my Cheerios. Um, Carl and John from Lilydale. Yeah. Carl and Nancy from Faulkner. Joan from Faulkner. Pat from Northcote. Sue from Mill Park. Peter from Wangaretta. Pat and his wife and, and his staff of Wangaretta. Ray uh, of Chetson. And Brian of Fairfield. Terrific. Thank, Thank you very much, Phyllis, for that. Appreciate that, as always, you calling in. Uh, Clive's in the basin. Hello, Clive. G'day, Andrew. How are you tonight? Terrific. Uh, can I talk, speak to Phil for a moment, please? Yeah, well, oh, both of us listening, uh, Clive. Phil, uh, I'm probably, you probably know me better as uh, Mr Rainy Day Books. Mel's my wife. Oh, how are you doing, buddy? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, just ring it up to say thank you for that. The card you sent me. Oh, we've been very concerned about you. This is Merrill's husband. He's been yeah. far from well, mm -hmm. and uh, I just thought the card would cheer you up a little. And uh, also, I'd like to thank all the listeners who uh, who ring through and talk to Merrill. Yeah, well, I hope you're on the road to recovery, Clive, and I'm sure you're in many people's prayers. Thank you very much. Just take care, buddy, and uh, just to get stronger day by day, won't you? And yes, give sure. Will. Thank you very much. Have a good night. And give Merrill a hug for us before you turn in. It's already 13 to 12. No, it feels like it. 13 to 11. Uh, back with you, Ken, at Chernside Park in a moment. Firstly, Michelle Lainsworth of the Herald Sun. Hi, Michelle. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm great. Let me guess what might be leading the story tomorrow. What's on page one? Is, so, it, is it a footy story, maybe? Uh, we don't have a footy story, but we do have a great footy photo on yeah. the front page of some great kids who are uh, representing Victoria with their respective teams, the Cats and the Bulldogs, ahead of this weekend's matches. You're right. But uh, the front page story is about a psychologist who knew of plans by a group of extremists to leave the country and uh, fight with Islamic State but said nothing is uh, something that police are alleging and are investigating. Yeah, what else so is inside? Inside, we've got a, um, a, a tough story for um, an Australian BMX champion who um, recently uh, had... Well, uh, sorry, he won a medal at the London Olympics, but recently has had a crash in training and it has left him with no movement from his chest down. So... The man is Sam Willoughby, and he's an Australian BMX rider, and he's in US hospital at the moment, and he's fractured some vertebra, and uh, unfortunately is uh, is hoping that he will one day be able to walk again, but at this mm. point is uh, is undergoing a lot of treatment. Oh, that's very tragic. Have you got a happy story there for us? Um, I've got a, a, a great story for the ladies about uh, a 28-year-old lady called Zoe Boyd, who is the first female winding engine driver in the history of the Victorian gold fields. So she's working in Bendigo and uh, she's working on an, on a, an old style uh, cart in the, uh, in the gold mines. Okay. So and it's a great story. Yeah, and there'll be a photo there to accompany that, of course. Yes, yes, of course. And the lift out tomorrow might be the car guide, I think. Yes, you are correct. Okay, and have a happy weekend, uh, Michelle, and uh, that goes to everyone at the Herald Sun. Thank you. Good night now as uh, Andrew goes back to calls. Yeah, we do in Kent's at Turnside Park. Thanks for holding on, Kent. Oh, that's all right. And top of the evening to you, Mr McLaren and Mr <laughs> Brady, and the very well-mannered young lady on the phone whose name I didn't catch. Oh, that's Kristen. Kirsten. Kirsten, is it? Oh, uh, top of the evening to you too, Kirsten. Um, you brought up something. I'd like to speak about charities, if you don't mind, that Stephen yeah. Price is touching on. Uh -huh. But you mentioned about your upcoming flight to um, South America. Yes. And I'm suffering from the same as you because I fly out on the 3rd of... I 
popped over to see our brand new grandson and three existing grandchildren, daughter and American military son-in-law. Oh, congratulations. Oh, not only that, but it just brought back memories of when I used to fly out of Port Moresby to Hong Kong on a Qantas 707. Yeah. And as soon as the lights, no smoking light went out, the lights dimmed and then the seatbelt light would disappear, you'd see 10 to 20 of us rise up, head down to the back of the plane and oh. start chuffing away. Yeah. Great days. <laughs> oh, yes, when you could still smoke on planes. Uh, oh, yeah. Kent, where about, whereabouts in the States is your daughter located? Um, she's in a little rural town like Cold Creek uh, in southern Indiana, just about 40 minutes drive from Louisville, Kentucky, just across the border. Oh, interesting, yes. Not too many Australians would get to that part of America, would they? Oh, and Peter Hitchner mentioned before about Texas in um, Queensland. I'm visiting a couple we know very, very well for about oh, six years, seven years now. They come from a place called Baghdad, Kentucky. <laughs> oh, really? Well, really? What a name. doesn't have their H, and one of their neighbouring towns is Paris. Yes. And, you know, I tracked down to Bethlehem in America once and spoke to someone in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. Now, I don't mean to be crude, but I've been into a beautiful little town in Pennsylvania in Amish country called Intercourse. Oh, really? That's unusual. Yeah, yeah. and I've actually got a bridge magnet with it written all over it. Oh. Uh, and, <laughs> well. you know, you have trolleys, uh, not trolleys, the carriages and horses going down the side streets and parking away from the cars. And... Yes. I'm sure that would have, uh, for the Amish people, have some sort of religious significance, that yes. name, I, I oh, imagine. Yeah, but the, um, the cheese that they make in this area is just to die for. Really? Yes. Probably the best cheese I've ever had. Oh. Uh, funnily enough, I saw a documentary on SBS this very week in the Amish uh, area of Philadelphia. Uh, was a train doco on SBS earlier in the week, and um, we saw a lot of the Amish community. What's the name of your new grandson, Kent? Jeremiah. Oh, great. Well, I think you and your wife should go and celebrate at the Pancake Parlour. I've got a $50 voucher for you. Pancake Parlour open 24 hours at High Point, Doncaster, and more than east. It'll be a lovely experience, Kent. Thank you. Can I actually mention about the charities very quickly? Yes. Um, religiously, for many years now, I've always given to the Salvation Army. Yeah. You know, uh, stuff that the clothes that don't have stains, holes, or wear marks in them, uh -huh. and little solid goods around the house that they accept. I've just stopped doing that because I've just recently heard from a Salvation Army, I shouldn't mention it, but I did, um, uh, volunteer that the Victorian chief officer for them gets around $600,000 a year salary. So now I give to SIDS as a container at the Churnside Park um, shopping centre. Well, we're not 100% sure about all that. and It no. seems an extraordinarily high salary. But Kent, all the best uh, with uh, your trip to America. No, no, Kent, uh, you went to air with... Uh that expose, and it sounds most unlikely to me. I would imagine it's hearsay. I think you've heard it second hand and you've passed it on, which is a bit irresponsible. Uh, all the salvos that I know, and uh, like Brent and Nottle and all those people, they virtually work for a pittance or work for free. Yes. Um, anyway, there may be an, an outside company brought in to raise money, but it's 600000 I don't know. Anyway, we'll have to leave it there, Kent, but all the best for the trip. It is 6 to 11. This is Nightline. Andrew McLaren filling in for Simon Owens for the night. We'll be back with more of your calls right after these. Looking for love interests, uh, the Tinder users can now tap into Spotify, too, uh, using music to help find their loved one. You know, if you have a similar taste in music, you think, oh, I like the Stones, or whatever, I like classical, whatever it may be. This may be another way to lead you to the path of love. So in your bachelor <laughs> days, were you ever tempted to go to Spotify, for example? Well, it didn't or, exist. Or did you want to appear on Perfect Match with Greg Evans? <laughs> No, I used to take out little ads in the back of Australasian Post. Oh, OK. Yes, and, uh, you know, spunky bachelor <laughs> with uh, windswept hair, seeking a uh, lady who has similar interests. I hope you didn't enclose a photo. It would have been a bit of a switch -off. Oh, that's kind. That's very really kind. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you very much. You might, uh, folks, after 11, give us your experiences if you've been looking for love in all the right places. And uh, Andy will come back with Tiffy and Chris. Chris and David and Sue and all your calls after the news. 
And thanks to the Ian Reid of Vendor Advocacy, we can now cross to the Weather Bureau of Meteorology, of course, and we're speaking tonight to Keris Art. Good evening, Keris. Evening. Well, how was it today? What was our top? What was our bottom? What? How did it shape up? The top and the bottom and the top was only 13.4. That sunshine never got round yeah, to uh, felt breaking like it through too. the cloud. Yeah. And yeah, it kept it pretty cool. Um, but uh, look ahead, it's going to be a bit warmer tomorrow. We're going for a max of 18 after a minimum of 9 tonight. So that should be pretty pleasant after the last few days of cool weather. Um, showers have pretty much gone. There's a little bit of drizzle coming through uh, at the moment. Um, that should be gone by the morning. Uh, could be a bit of fog uh, up uh, about the hills in the east, but that's about it. Just a partly cloudy day for Friday. Not a huge amount to talk about. Really. No. How's the weekend going to be? Uh, Saturday's looking pretty good at this stage. Uh, clouds going to be increasing uh, during the day as the front approaches from the west. Pretty warm. We're going for a max of 20 degrees. Um, and just a partly cloudy day, as I said. Uh, showers developing, but you're probably not going to see anything until very close to midnight. Uh, so it is very late kind of showers. Uh, and then Sunday, that rain comes through during the morning um, with the front uh, easing off in the afternoon. What, uh, uh, how, how many millimetres do you think Melbourne will get? Melbourne, uh, you know, central Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. All, all told, uh, from late Saturday night and Sunday, uh, somewhere between you know two and five millimetres probably, so not a huge amount. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, a little bit. <laughs> OK. And for back to work Monday? Yeah, so cool temperatures behind that front, uh, 17 on Sunday and 17 again on Monday. A couple of showers hanging about, but not much in it. Just, uh, just trace amounts up to a millimetre potentially. Um, and looking at those kind of conditions persisting for the next few days, Tuesday, partly cloudy, 19, very slight chance for shower. Um, later in the week, it gets a little bit uncertain. It does look like the next uh, rain event's coming through sometime on Wednesday or Thursday. There's going to be some wet, wet conditions come through, but at this stage, um, it's a bit hard to, hard to predict where, how the system's going to develop. So late next week, we're looking at another another wet event but up until then it's going to be relatively dry and a little bit warm on the weekend and then cooling down for the start of the week. Not too bad. Thanks Keris. Thank you. Keris Art from the Bureau of Meteorology. It is nine past eleven. This is Nightline and if you're wondering if you just switched on who the voice is, it's Andrew McLaren filling in for Simon who's back again very very soon. In fact, he's back. Is he back? No, he's not back tomorrow, is he? No, it's Sunday night. Sunday night, yeah, pardon me. And, and you're back for Friday lunch in 14 hours. <laughs> I am too. You want to sleep here overnight? <laughs> I don't mind anything from Macquarie okay. Broadcasting. You know of I mean? course, I know you. Uh, passing parade is next. Then we're going to Hong Kong briefly before we talk to Tiffy, Chris, David and Sue. This is John Doremus with the passing parade of the story of a miser, Daniel Dancer, who in his time was dubbed the meanest man in the world. It could have been said of Daniel Dancer that he was born mean. He came from a long line of misers. His father and his father's father before him were notorious for their tight-fistedness. But Daniel was far and away the meanest of them all. I'll be back to tell you more after this message. On the death of his father in 1736, Daniel Dancer inherited the ancestral Dancer Mansion, which stood in 80 acres of lush meadowland adjoining Harrow Common. He was then 20 years of age, a young man to be envied, one would have supposed healthy, wealthy, in the prime of life. But Daniel didn't see it that way. Enlisting the services of his sister as housekeeper in return for her board and lodgings, he embarked on an economy drive that was to last till his dying day. And as the years passed, he became something of a celebrity. And people came from all parts of England to catch a glimpse of the meanest man in the world, a title originally bestowed on him by the pupils of Harrow School across the common. When his sister fell ill, he refused to call a doctor. Why should I waste my money in wickedly endeavoring to counteract the will of providence, he replied to a neighbor who had had the temerity to suggest as much. If the old girl's time has come, the nostrums of all the quacks in Christendom cannot save her. She may as well die now as at any future period. As it happened, the old girl's time had come. Dancer wouldn't hear of paying the undertaker for her coffin, and after lengthy bickering, the latter agreed to accept and exchange an equivalent amount of timber from the oak trees that bordered the estate. 
For the funeral, however, he made a concession by attiring himself in splendid array. He even ran to a top hat. True, it had no top, and half the brim was missing, but it conveyed the general idea. He arrived at the graveside on a borrowed horse. As he was about to dismount, the horse displayed a notable absence of decorum by hurling him from the saddle into the grave to the huge delight of the Harrow boys assembled for the occasion. Despite his appearance of poverty, Dancer was known to be a wealthy man. In the last 14 years of his life, his house was robbed no less than 14 times. One gang of intruders strung him up by the heels in an effort to make him tell where his money was hoarded. In fact, it was hidden in many different places. And by and large, the thieves were thwarted. For all his meanness, Dancer was popular with the locals because of his fights against encroachments on Harrow Common by the big landowners, who were kept at bay largely as a result of his strenuous opposition. His motives were anything but altruistic, however. Indeed, he was only interested in keeping them out because he feared enclosure of the common would put an end to his scavenging. After his death, a search of the ramshackle house revealed the extent of his wealth. Daniel Dancer could have lived like a king. He chose instead to lead the life of a pauper, so much in love with his money that he couldn't bear to part with a penny. He was buried in Harrow Churchyard, and it's said that his ghost long haunted the spot, moaning and groaning over the cost of his funeral. Our time is up till we meet again for another chapter in the Passing Parade. This is John Doremus. Thank you so much, and goodbye for now. And uh, Andy John Doremus returns Sunday night for Remember When. I remind you, special guest in the 9 o'clock special, Ron Lees. It will be terrific. Who's Australia's Mario Lanza, really, is That's right. Absolutely still, terrific. And for people who don't remember, was very much a part of one of the most successful variety shows Channel 7 had in its early days, Sunny Side Up. Yeah, more recently on Good Morning Australia That's with right, Bernie yeah. Owen, still uh, very much in demand with a gorgeous daughter, Andrea who follows in his footsteps. Really? She might come in too. Hey folks, we're off to Hong Kong. There's a song that I recall my mother sang to me. She sang it as she tucked me in when I was ninety-three. I never mind. Who was that bum? Ying tang 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 Oh, yes, a little bit of atmosphere as we talk to Simon Fuller in Hong Kong. And Simon, you've got a special reason for phony and good evening to you. Oh, good evening, um, um, gentlemen. And just, yes, three years ago today, I got an urgent email from one Peter Smith, who I think is listening, and he said, can you go and visit Philip in hospital? And at the time, I'd just recently moved to Hong Kong and I wrote back to him and said, Peter, do you realise I live in Hong Kong? And he said, yes. And he sent me the, uh, the you're on one of the local leading newspapers, I believe, having taken a fall after videoing a typhoon that was happening on the Sunday night, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I must set the record straight. A lot of people think Bruce pushed me, but that is not true. He was not in no. Hong Kong at the time. He may have wanted to. <laughs> he might have wanted to. Yeah, but this was at the uh, wonderful hotel there in Kowloon, and you will recall the, the hotel. The Harbour View, um, the Harbour View, Philip, it's called. I wish I'd had those. a wonderful Harbour View. Yeah, I wish I'd had those marble stairs roped off, because it was very dark, and uh, I had my eye up to the viewfinder and tumbled down those stairs precisely three years ago to this hour. And Simon, you were so good to come along every day. I must tell Andrew, he came uh, because I mainly was eating noodles and rice, you know, for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And Simon arrived every day with Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's and French fries and... Good, healthy oh, food to uh, get you over that. Be forever grateful to you, Simon. Yes, well, no, it was, it was, um, it was good to see a familiar face having just landed in Hong Kong and starting a new chapter in my life back then. But um, 
I, I must say, Andrew, that I wasn't allowed to bring any cigarettes in. Matron frisked me at the door. <laughs> no, you're right. I, I went 11 days without a cigarette and shouldn't have gone back onto them. But described, I was in the public hospital. Uh, my insurance would have allowed me to go into a private one, but, you know, I wanted to stick with the same surgeon and people like yourself, you all knew where I was. I didn't want to move yes. around Hong Kong. And so I stayed put. But... Mary's, it's Queen Elizabeth Hospital in on the Kowloon side, which yeah. is quite close to your hotel. Yeah, and, and the staff were wonderful, but I was in a dormitory with 12 other guys, none of whom spoke English. Isn't that true? Yeah, that, that is true, but um, look, you, you obviously recovered well, and um, we've had a couple of typhoons here this year, actually. Yes. And when we do have a typhoon, everything stops. It gets to a signal one, and people get a bit excited. A signal uh -huh. three, and then a signal eight, that means... Stop what you're doing. Do not go anywhere. If you haven't left for work, you stay at home. Mm. If the children haven't gone to school, well, they stay at home too. So it's, it can be very disruptive. And trying to get a taxi home um, can be very expensive because the drivers will uh, ask you to pay a special um, oh. service fee. Well, that, that sounds fair enough. I think they're entitled to ask for a surcharge. But the reason I got caught in the typhoon, Andrew, I was indoors inside the hotel. I had wanted to go to the top floor and film the lights from the swimming pool. I see. But I was stuck behind glass, and I'm sort of wandering around doing the video at the window and, and you know, just sort of crabbing my way around without looking where I'm walking. And that's why I tumbled down the stairs to uh, to a basement bar. But, Simon, thoughtful of you to ring me on the anniversary, and uh, we should do this every year. It should be tradition. Oh, and we, we, we should. We look we should forward to really. seeing you back in Melbourne sometime very soon. Sometime soon indeed, and you're off to uh, Columbia, are you? Yeah, but not for another week or so yet. And Andrew will be here every night uh, no, keeping Simon right company. If I, can have a chance, if I can have a chance to tune in, I certainly will. But beware of the uh, Colombian marching powder while you're there. It's not good to uh, Okay, <laughs> and, and, and by the way, Hong Kong's gain is Channel 9's loss because Simon was a very important part of the news division at 9 in Melbourne That's right. in years gone by. And you've proved to be a really good friend, Simon. Thanks, buddy. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to listen to you and pleasure to say a cheerio on what is a momentous day in the life of Philip Brady. Yes, my third anniversary of my fall from grace. 21 past 11, 3AW. Thank you, Tiffy of Doreen, for holding on for so long. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Hello, darling Andy, and hi, Phil. How are you going? Oh, hi, Tiffy, and say hello to Simon, who's driving home from Faulty Towers. Hello, Sci-Pi. Oh, and by the way, um, I don't like the way that that Arnott's have done what they've done to the barbecue shapes, but I'll talk to you about that next week. Oh, yeah, do. But, oh, yeah, anyway. Now, I'm going to talk about... Oh, actually, uh, sorry. Um, before I talk about um, doggies and in the animal kinds, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm so um, happy for you, Phil, that, that you're suddenly, you know... Um, getting a lot better from that fall you had three years ago. I didn't oh, even know three years ago Tiffy, today. Tiffy, don't think about it. That's way in the past and right know, behind me. Yeah, you, you, trust me, you, you're doing a lot, of, a lot better than other people. <laughs> I, I had a very, very good surgeon. He was Chinese yeah, and uh, uh, I'm yeah. trying to think of his name now. It's so long ago, but... <laughs> Uh, but he really did me proud. Except I made a big mistake, Tiffy and Andrew. Uh, uh, there was a big story in the Melbourne Observer about my fall, and uh, the headline talked about the hospital from hell. Oh, and wow. unfortunately, oh, wow. when I sent my surgeon the press cutting, I forgot oh, to cut away the the headline. <laughs> oh, so I probably, no. I probably hurt his feelings. Oh, that is he, he, oh, did, he didn't ever send me a card back, Andrew. Funny about that. That's no good. Anyway. Now, about doggies, you know how you were saying, Phil, how, you know, um, dogs do funny things and sometimes heartbreaking things? Well, the funny things that my dogs do, now I've got two chihuahuas, I'll try and be quick, but, um, yeah, um, Brian and Seth, and they're really funny. The one thing Brian in particular does, he, every time I pick him up, it's really funny, he puts his left, you know, his right paw, sorry, in my pocket, and I have never understood why, and Seth, because uh, I've trained them both how to put their head down so I can kiss them on top of the head. Well, tonight we had a slight accident. It nearly turned nasty, actually. The two of them were, you know, growling and, you know, not growling nastily, but play growling in their bed because we've recently had vinyl put down thanks to carpet court and underwatting. Um, and anyway, 
they were in their bed and playing, and all of a sudden I heard a squeal, and I'm thinking, okay, is that the incinerator? Because Howie was go- uh, was um, was uh, was getting rid of some scraps. I thought, what the hell? Anyway, um, the squeals kept continuing. I thought, oh dear. So anyway. What I ended up finding was um, Brian's collar had got caught on Seth's foot and he couldn't get out, so I had to unhook him. And Brian got out, but Seth, it took me about 15 seconds more to unhook him. Yeah. It was just as well that I found out that, he's, that the collar was actually doing a bit of, not damage, but it, giving them a bit of trouble. So I, I think I did actually get some collars from the RSPCA, but I've got to get Howie to try and find those. Yeah. But it was just as well, I, you know, it, it was not exactly funny, although I'll probably look back and laugh maybe next week. But um, it, it was just, you know, it was just as well. I got him uncaught. I said, oh, Sissy boy, you were right. And he grunts, yeah, I'm fine. And then just takes off running and goes, hello, howie boy. Uh, yeah, well, that's dogs for you. Now, Tiffy, thank you very much for your call and all and, the best. And well, Tiffy, I love the name Brian and Sess. Yeah, as we say goodnight here, Kirsten has a bataki ham for you. Don't hang up. Yeah. A bataki mini easy cut ham. Bataki is simply the best. Chris is in Broadmeadows. Hello, Chris. Hello, guys. Um, I'm sorry if this sounds confronting, but... Over a period of time now, a lot of people are saying to me, Chris, we don't hear you on the radio, on the Nightline program. And I said, well, look, sorry to say, well, since the program's been cut down from a four-hour program to a two-hour program, I, I've had to make concessions. Uh, there is a it must have been very but, hard for you, Chris. Yeah, well, it's very hard to interact in the Nightline program because now the, the good plus is that Australia Overnight are now starting to go back to what we had with Melbourne Overnight, taking calls after 3.30 a.m., through to 10, quarter past five. Um, so that's my love and joy. And uh, so I would, with the, uh, the latest start at 10 p.m. for Nightline, I will try and participate. And I had to say some people, sometimes I may be waiting on hold well into the last hour. And, mm. and so I've had to, well, the, the view, the listening audience will make the Nightline program number one. And now we have only a two-hour program with interviews and some talkbacks, we don't hear a flow of those natural or first time or long term callers naturally interacting a few times each week and so yes. uh, it's sad but, um, I, but I appreciate, I'm very humble for any uh, interaction I have and it's not just course over, I listen like on a Monday night I listen to Paddy Noon for the first hour and I don't ring up on a Monday night hardly now because I'll just listen to, for the full two hours because I'm trying to get my sleep patterns in order so I can get out of bed early hours in the morning you know otherwise I'll be waking up with eyes hanging out of my head after about two or three hours sleep so but it, it's, it's just constructive criticism in the third. I mean, while you're still breaking in what it is to make it number one with the listing audience, the, what we had so precious for so many years, a lot of us just have to make concessions and make a few changes. But I always say to people just to be positive because, you know, we, you know, we, we, we all felt sad when Bruce Mansfield died or when Keith McGowan died and stuff like that. And we should hold on to these Philip Brodies, these Simon Owens and yourself, Andrew, because, you know, you, we, we, we all won't be around for, at some point of time. No, no. that's oh, very that's, sad thought. That's rather, uh, yeah. uh, rather and sobering. And now, Chris, don't shed any tears. You're always welcome on the show. Uh, you're on most nights of the week, even if you have to wait a while. John Deeks makes you very welcome after midnight. Mm. Uh, you know, as does uh, all the midnight to Dawn boys through the years. Tony, Tony John. Moclair, Dawn. Us too, I and, know, of and, and the fact that we're down to two hours, well, swallow that because we all accept that. Uh, Steve Price has a, a huge following, he writes, and at least we have the four hour show for you on a Sunday night. Thank you so much. It is 29 to 12. This is Nightline on 3AW. Uh, I'm having, I'm, I'm, it's a tonic being with you tonight, Phil. I'll tell you that because I've been struggling today and yesterday. You know why? The Brad and Angelina breakup. I mean, it's just knocked me for a loop. Oh, I imagine I mean, it, it would have. It is just, I, I don't know where to start. Yeah. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought a Hollywood couple getting divorced? Can mm. you believe it? I know how upset you were when Richard Burton and Liz Taylor broke up. Well, the I, first I, time. I, I, it, you I, were beside yourself. I, for years after that. And here it goes again. And I, I mean, yeah. for, can, what, they're putting it on the front page of the newspaper on the Adult Sun. I mean, how ludicrous. Who cares? Oh, well, they're big names, aren't they? And of course, I invest so much of my uh, my moral compass in uh, in Hollywood lifestyles. Don't oh, no. My goodness me, how people can be involved. Dave's at one taggy. Hello, Dave. Yeah, Andrew, nice to talk to you again. Thank uh, you, Dave. Well, yes. Uh, and, of course, uh, 
um, both of you, Ross. Uh, um, thanks, Dave. How's Simon, anyway? Oh, he's fine. He went to Faulty Towers tonight. He'll tell you all about it Sunday night. Oh, we, uh, talking of early television, one of our friends uh, in Bendigo was the first to have a TV in Bendigo, 1954-55, and it had a 150-foot high mast to get the signal. And it, the where, where was the signal well. coming from? Pardon? Where was the signal coming from? Well, seem to remember the um, if you remember the Blue Mountains. It was coming over the Blue Mountains, I think. But I remember I still got actually a picture of the, on the front page of the Bendigo Advertiser, yeah. the first picture that appeared. Good heavens! And then talking about the the central de Bora mine is that where that lady is working. When I was a child, I used to cycle and watch the brake man. I used to sit behind the brake man operating the um, you know, the big coil of wire to bring the uh, to bring the cage up and down inside that. Mine, you know, it's now a tourist attraction. Yeah. That was the early 50s. But talking of love, true love, my wife is an absolute gem for being true love. Um, she was only nine when she read of me uh, in the Herald in the AAP report. And she hor told her horrified grandparents she wanted to marry that chap in the newspapers when she was only nine. So they had the newspapers for me. She couldn't read about me anymore. Mm. And uh, as you know, I was coming back to Australia leaving a very good job in London, yes. government service, when the princess married somebody else. And um, mm. I have to say that every second of my life since 1995, when I met Helen uh, indirectly through, through AW, she has been an absolutely bonds woman. She, she's the most kind-hearted person. Yeah. And she invited Princess Anne. Now, a lady in waiting wrote back and said, no, she had to be in the Queen Mother's, celebrating the Queen Mother's um, birthday up in Scotland. Well, God struck me dead if I'm lying, chaps. And Simon Arnes was there. Claire Brady was there for Channel 7 Television News. Yeah. And when I saw Claire, you know, there on the corner of King and Batman Street, I thought, I can't walk the princess into a trap. She wasn't supposed to be there. Oh. But she came with Prince Andrew. Mm. They've yeah, flown well, out for the wedding. That's lovely. Yeah, and, and, and Simon was actually at Dave's wedding. Yes, as well. I believe so. It was quite a star-studded event, wasn't it? And Dave, I had the pleasure of meeting you and your wife at uh, Bruce's uh, farewell. And I know you have, I admire you have very high standards. And Sue's there in Jembrook. Hi, Sue. Hey, boys. Phil and Andy, Matt. Good to speak to oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yes, um, thanks. A couple of things. I'd love to say <clears throat> a big shout out and hello to the lovely Tiffy. She said some wonderful things to myself and other people on Facebook. She's given us big heads and we can't take any more. <laughs> Secondly, last night, well, earlier tonight with Pete, you were talking about pulling people up on correcting themselves. Uh, putting your, uh, your foot in your mouth, yes. Yeah, wrong names and what yes. have you. Yeah, big slap to John Deeks last night. What did what did Deeks he do? Um, he was talking to somebody who was a spotter for a news station. Yes. And the the thing that came up was, so uh, where were you when such and such happened? Uh -huh. And this guy, I can't remember his name, said about the Russell Street bombing. Mm. Mm, sorry, Deeks, he... Oh, you well, called her Angela Ayres about three or four times. Her name was Angela Taylor. OK, well, if you've got a problem with that, you give DC a call after midnight. But, Sue, take home from us a Bataki mini easy cut ham because Bataki is simply the best. Andy, great being in your company tonight. And the good news is while I'm OS in Columbia, South America, Andrew will be here with Simon for Nightline and David Mann for Remember When. Now, looking forward to it. And could be a problem phoning in because of the time difference. I think uh, when you're on air at night, I think it's about 5 or 6 a.m. where I am. One thing, please, Phil, don't become a drug mule, will you, while you're in Colombia? I'd hate mm. to think of that. Okay. If any man comes up to you at an airport and says, could you take this little parcel for me back to Australia? Really? Okay. Please. <laughs> you see, Phil Wood, dear listener, he's so sweet and naive, Phil, yes. that he would probably <laughs> say, oh, all right, I don't mind taking this little package of white powder back to Australia. Oh, it's a Johnson's baby powder. <laughs> Uh, Margaret's in Ashburton. Hi, Margaret. G'day, Philip. How are you going? And oh, hello, Andrew. We're, we're, having, hello, Mark. we're having the best time. Oh, I can tell. 
<laughs> and you'll have a lovely time when you go away. There's nothing more refreshing than getting away from even things that you like at the moment. I know. It's been 18 months. I'll just be sad putting Oro into kennels. That will break my heart, but he'll be okay. I'd love it. I'd love to get a dog. I've been wanting a dog for ages. Right. Anyway, the reason I'm ringing up tonight, if you don't mind, it's a community announcement. I'm a member of Ashburton Community Residents Association and we're having a, a market day at the Copeland Room at uh, Ashburton Library and that's at High Street Ashburton on Saturday. So you know what an artisan market is, I hope. Most, most people don't. It means that it's all handmade things. Um, you know, if you're looking for a special gift or something uh, unique or special just for you, uh, the range of handmade uh, quality goods available will be will not be disappointing. Um, Have also, you got tea cosies, Margaret? Yes, there will be tea cosies, believe it or not. The world needs more tea cosies, is what I've How always said. How do you know that there's a lady there that sells tea cosies? Oh, I know so many things, Margaret. It's frightening. Well, there you go. Um, there's art and jewellery and woodcraft. I could go on forever, but I won't. But the thing is... Just take me to this tea cosy stall. That's all I want. OK, then you're going to meet me there? Oh, hello. Mm. <laughs> OK, anyway, I just want to let you know that it's on between uh, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. That's not very long, but we know that people want to get home and watch the football. Yeah, of course, very smart. And if they don't want to watch football, there's plenty of um, coffee and yeah. snack shops. So and ju just give us village. the where and the when again, please, Margaret. Okay, then, I'll do that. Um, it's actually at the Copeland Room of the Ashburton Library. Yeah. That's High Street, Ashburton. Mm -hmm. And it's open between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Mm hmm on Saturday. Okay, now Margaret, I can't give you a dog, but I will give you a Bataki Mini Easy Cut Ham because Bataki is simply the best. And thanks and, very much for your call. And Kirsty will get your details. Jeff is on the mobile. Hello, Jeff, and thank you for holding so much. No worries at all. Hello, Andrew, and hello, Phil. Hi again, um, Jeff. Let me just say quickly the lady that rang in um, criticising uh, Deeksy, he, if she'd stayed on a bit longer, he did correct himself with uh, the lady's name. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she's obviously missed that. Oh, yeah, we all make mistakes like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, and he did, but he did certainly correct himself yeah. uh, later in the program. Mm. So, Thanks, but Jeff. Look, um, Andrew, I was well. Firstly, too, let me say to Simon, who's driving home, well done, because I know when I had um, that operation many years ago, I couldn't drive the car for a week. Hey, so, hey, <laughs> you say he's driving home. He lives in Box Hill, uh, which is about twenty-five minutes from the city, and he left the studio an hour ago. If he's still in the car, he's very slow. Well, yes, but he's possibly a bit slow to move, too, because he can be a bit tender after that, Phil. So, oh, after what um, happened this yeah. week. But mm. Also, Andrew, I listened with interest when you were talking about dating agencies and the like and what was around in your day and possibly my day. And yes. um, you talked about the Australasian Post. Well, yes. I know in my day and certainly before that, you, you sort of met people... Um, on the dance floor during the barn dance, really, was when you met them as you changed partners. Yeah, right? yeah. that's uh, very yeah. true. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I found dancing was not my forte, and I, I found placing little personal ads in the back of the paper, was uh, the, the magazine, uh, well, was quite, uh, it worked at times. Yeah, well, the other thing, too, where I used to, as a teenager and into my 20s, perhaps get most of my advice from, if you remember, that wonderful newspaper, The Truth, and that wonderful <laughs> column of Heart Farm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a lesson in life, wasn't it, yeah. Jeff? Yeah, in fact, Andy used to write in there anonymously many times where there's emotional problems. I'll bet he did. Anyway, it's a very great show, guys. All right, Jeff, and have okay. a good weekend. Might talk to you on uh, Remember When. Uh, how did you meet Joanne originally? Was we, it well, a blind it was, a, it was an office romance. We both worked at 3DB together. Oh. In the was basement that in there. the Bert Newton days or earlier? That was before Bert, yes. Right. Before Bert took it over. Uh, yes, we were both there, and that's very strange, because it was underneath the newspaper, yes. 3DB, if you remember. Yes, Lane. Yeah, and uh, with the, uh, all the studios everywhere, because it had been 3DB 3LK. That's right. And it had, 
there were studios everywhere. There were like six studios and an oh, auditorium. And really? It was all rather marvellous, like a, an uh, underground sort of, um, like the war room, I imagine, uh, in Churchill's yeah, day. Now, what would it be today? What's, what would be in those cells I now? believe it's a cafe now. Oh, or, uh, or part of 3DB is really? a cafe now. How interesting. Yeah. And what year would this be that you met? Was she in the record library? No, she worked in the office of doing the ads, you know, um, oh, assembling traffic, the, the traffic. That's it. I oh, couldn't think of the term. That's right. I worked there and I used to pass by this rather attractive girl with long hair. Well, um, I guess tomorrow it'll be uh, Darren and uh, Dennis and yourself. It's always good fun. Right, yeah. Last call of the night, last call on Nightline for the week. Barry at Watson here. Hi, Barry. Good evening, uh, Philip and Andrew. And, and, and I, I have to be fair with you, Barry. We only have a minute. Okay. <clears throat> true love, real, real true love is to be in a continual state of sublime euphoria. Yeah. I'd like to run a, a, a quick quote past you yes. that I've written long since. Wisdom's ancient whispers are fed through the labyrinth of the minds of time, waiting to sp spring and then to spread from millions of books that still remain unread. Mm -hmm. It's rather profound, isn't it? In fact, I'm having trouble untangling it, but it's it sounds wonderful. Did you write that, Barry? Yeah, yep. Oh, you're a very clever man. Yeah. Very good. I love that uh, continual state of euphoria. It'd be very hard to maintain. Joanne and I have been married for 31 years. I couldn't really, I couldn't really <laughs> say. It's been every moment of every day has been euphoric. <laughs> I wish, but and I'm sure Joanne wouldn't say it. But thanks for the call, Barry. Appreciate it. Uh, Poet laureate, take home a Bataki Mini Easy Cut Ham because Bataki is simply the best. A few lines called Flowers of Choice. I'd rather have one little rose from the garden of a friend than all the very choicest flowers when my stay on earth should end. I'd rather have one pleasant word in kindness said to me than flattery when my heart is still and life has ceased to be. I'd rather have a smile now from friends I know are true than tears shed around my casket when I've bid this life adieu. So give me please your flowers today for whether white or red I'd rather have one blossom now than a truckload when I'm dead. Copyright restricts distribution of this piece by any means of duplication. It's 10 to 12. Well, Andrew, it's been great fun uh, being with you again. I've really had a ball, and uh, I look forward to hearing you on Friday lunch with the boys. And let me be one of the first to say uh, Godspeed on your, your trip to Phil, because I won't you. see you again until you're uh, back from Colombia. Still a week away before I head to uh, Santiago, Chile, and then up to Bogota, and then to Bucaramanga, to Santa Marta, Medellin, Santander, uh, Baru, which is an island in the Caribbean. Oh, yes. Have you got your budgie smugglers ready? <laughs> Buddy, I've got them on now. I'm always ready. You <laughs> never know when I want to go for a midnight dip. <laughs> and I must say, I notice them now, the first time I've seen them, because the lighting's not too good on that side of the studio. They, you look rather gorgeous in them. I've got to say that I mean that in the most heterosexual way. Ever been skinny dipping, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> not with you, mate. Yeah. Uh, Andy, take care, and thanks for holding the fort tonight. Always a pleasure. And to you, Kirsten, it's been a real pleasure. And folks, don't forget Sunday night on Remember When. Uh, Simon's back for that with Kevin Trask and uh, special guest at 9 o'clock, Ron Lee's one of the uh, early faces of Sunny Side Up. John Deeks has his own theme, which is uh, the John Dunbar theme. It should be the John Deeks theme. Well, good morning, gentlemen. And, well, it's almost morning. Uh, good evening uh, for another five minutes. Um, junk. Tell me. Uh, uh, a junk, uh, junk yeah, mail? This, this is, no, no, this is the time of the, the year where people are putting a lot of junk out on their nature strips. They do, Oh, too. yes, And yes. I tell the kids who come through Channel 7 for tours, you're the last of the generation to see the cathode tube TV sitting on the nature strip. Oh, yes. <laughs> big, and because the bigger ones are better, uh, they were fantastic. But And uh, you'll have to go to Acme and to all the other places to see them very soon. But oh. what's the most interesting things that you've seen put out 
on the notice trip. I yeah. can tell you one of the most, most prolific things you see, if that's not the word, anyway, that'll do, yeah. uh, you see, and that is old gym equipment that hasn't been used yes. that much. Oh, how sad. True, true. So, uh, we'll be talking about that. And I, also, I might phone in. No, I'll tell you now, Zed. I saw one night at midnight walking my dog, a wonderful bookcase. I thought I can put CDs in there and DVDs, yeah. but it was just too heavy to pick up. But a Chinese bloke rode along on his bike, probably a shift worker, and I said to him, would you help drag it up the street to buy uh, nature strip, please? And he did. Oh, and isn't it was that lovely? Much too heavy for one person. Did you give him something for his efforts at all? A CD? No, I don't. A I, talkie I, ham. He had my gratitude <laughs> and an autographed picture of <laughs> Bruce <laughs> and Phil. And Bruce and the budget, budget <laughs> smugglers. Uh, and uh, Jim Sherlock's story. Um, we've had a lot of people asking oh, to repeat that. What time will that be? Uh, that's uh, oh, about after 2 o'clock, I think. Oh, my, I must hear that. Yeah, it's fantastic. About, about living backstage at yes, the Regent. at the Regent and uh, his incredible life story. Just how, how come that he wasn't spotted by... A uh, fireman on duty or a security guard or whatever. No, never was found. A police occasionally would pick him up when he was scrounging for food on the street, but amazing. So uh, that's yeah. coming up. And lots more in your calls too on my last chance to be with you on Australia overnight. Oh, you're so sprightly. I don't know where you get all your energy. Budgie smugglers. I don't know what he's on, but I wish he'd share it with me. <laughs>